So I've been reading this book, Silence. I just finished it uh, today by Shusaku Endo. And this is not about the movie, directed by Martin Scorsese, that just came out. I haven't watched the movie. I am going to have to wait for it to come out on DVD. I don't know if it has yet or not, because I didn't get a chance to see it in theaters. And it didn't do very well in theaters, so I didn't get a chance to go watch it. But this is about the book. If you want a review of the movie, I can't help you yet. This book, uh, Endo has been compared plenty of times in in front of me to Graham Greene, whom uh, I really like a lot. Uh, the Power and the Glory is one of my favorite novels. And, uh, yeah, so Endo has been kind of called the Japanese Graham Greene. So if you've read Graham Greene, that can be helpful in sort of getting your legs to, to stand on the ground that is the work of Shusaku Endo. But I think as more than a passing sort of beginner's comparison, it's not helpful. Um, if by, you know, Endo is the Japanese Graham Greene, you mean that he is uh, deeply psychological, he is, uh, and very Catholic, and he is, and concerned with uh, human frailty and weakness and, uh, and the difficulties that that a life of faith presents intellectually and morally to people in, in uh, tough situations. Yeah, those are all good comparisons. But besides that, he's coming from a completely different point of view that is really nothing like Green, in my opinion. So in silence, spoilers ahead, just in case you care about those. In silence, you have the priest... Uh, Rodriguez, and he is uh, from Portugal. He and his friend go to find uh, Father Ferreira, who uh, has apostatized. And uh, uh, this is because the Japanese government at the time, um, in the late 1600s, if I remember right, is um, persecuting Catholics heavily, trying to get rid of Catholicism in Japan. And so you have all of this... Um, this background information that's really helpful presented to you in the book. This is, you know, sort of uh, the, the horrific situation going on for Japanese Christians. And Rodriguez goes to find his mentor, Ferreira, who's apostatized, because he can't believe it. And if he has, he sort of, if he does believe it, he sort of kind of hopes he can redeem Ferreira. But he also thinks he's going to go to his glorious martyrdom. Something he talks about a lot in the book. And oftentimes... Rarely do 10 or 15 pages go by before he's comparing himself very strongly to Christ. And he sees himself as Christ, and he's wondering who will be his own personal Judas, who will betray him. He sees this as inevitable. And, of course, he sees the character Kichijiro as his Judas, his own personal betrayer. And Kichijiro turns him into the authorities for 300 pieces of silver, and this leads to the whole climactic drama of the book, where uh, Rodriguez eventually... Uh, is tormented so much by hearing the, the sounds of the tortured Christians in the pit, which is this, this torture that the Japanese have come up with to get people to apostatize, uh, where they hang you upside down in a pit and there's, there's feces and urine and, and they cut your, 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 or behind your ears is what it is, so that your blood is running into your face and you die very slowly. And it's a very effective means of getting people to apostatize. It's horrific. And so he hears, over the course of days, initially he thinks it's snoring because it's this, this long, methodic moaning. And uh, he, to his astonishment, his horror, he discovers, he's informed by Ferreira, no, 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 that's Christians hanging in the pit, being tortured. And we'll stop torturing them, the Japanese will stop torturing them, rather, as soon as you, Rodriguez, apostatize. And Rodriguez, of course, he's... he's completely against this. He, he hates this. Uh, his friend uh, has already um, died as a martyr, uh, has refused to apostatize. But Rodriguez uh, is being saved by the Japanese government for this public apostasy. And Rodriguez, throughout the course of the book, talks about how he could quite easily undergo, he thinks, to any torture that someone would come up with uh, and not apostatize. But he didn't see something like this coming, where they're torturing people to get him to recant. Now, this happened to Ferreira, and Ferreira says, you know, they hung me in the pit for days, and don't think that I apostatized because of that. I held firm. I was strong. I, I refused to give up the faith in the face of torture until they began torturing other people. And 
and telling me, we'll stop once you recant the faith, renounce it publicly. And that's what broke Ferreira, because God was silent, he says, in the face of this, this horrific uh, atrocity that the Japanese were committing on their own people because they were Christian. And Ferreira says, because God was silent, that is why I recanted. So this is all a very difficult, obviously, ordeal for Rodriguez. And eventually he's worn down, and he is taken outside by Ferreira, and a Japanese interpreter, and he does, in fact, step on what's called the fumie, the fumie, I think, is how you pronounce it. Don't know any Japanese, so uh, forgive any mispronunciations from anyone who knows better, please correct me. Uh, but the fumie is an image of Christ, or the Virgin Mary sometimes, or maybe a saint, um, but usually Christ, and it's presented as Christ in this book, the face of Christ. And they would get the Japanese to prove they weren't Christians by having them step on this image, this fumier. And so Rodriguez is brought out to the fumier, and uh, he steps on it. And he steps on it because, from, from his train of, of tortured thought, these Christians who are hanging in the pit, they've already apostatized. It's not like they're holding firmly to the faith and, and, and they're just, you know, waiting to die slowly and agonizingly. They've already given up. Uh, under torture, under duress, extreme duress, right? So it's not like this is some full act of their will. They're being tortured and quite understandably have broken. You know, as, as the church will tell you, as uh, psychology will tell you, it's an extremely difficult thing. And the church would even argue impossible without immense grace and total reliance upon that grace to withstand torture, uh, I mean, torture makes people do and say insane things. So the moral culpability aside for the moment, uh, these people have already apostatized, and so Rodriguez says, why let them suffer for something they've already given up? Is it not the ultimate act of love, Ferreira says, the most painful act of love in history, I think are his exact words, to step on this fumier for these Christians who've apostatized already? Why prolong their suffering, is, is what he's saying. So, Rodriguez does it. And uh, that's not the most controversial part of the book. The most controversial part of the book is what happens when he's looking at the image. Let me see if I can just find it really quick. It shouldn't be too hard. Mm, right here. The priest raises his foot. In it he feels a dull, heavy pain. This is no mere formality. He will now trample on what he has considered the most beautiful thing in his life, on what he has believed most pure, on what is filled with the ideals and the dreams of man. How his foot aches. And then the Christ in bronze, the fumier, speaks to the priest, Trample, trample. I more than anyone know of the pain in your foot. Trample. It was to be trampled on by men that I was born into this world. It was to share men's pain that I carried my cross. The priest placed his foot on the fumier, dawn broke, and far in the distance, the cock crew. So, the reason that's controversial is because a lot of people see this book as endorsing apostasy, as saying, look, Rodriguez did a good thing, right? He, he apostatized to save these people, and look, even God understands this. God's saying, do it, save these people. Now, it's not ever really made clear that this isn't just Rodriguez speaking to himself in, in you know, he's been tortured. He's not really all there in the moment, and, and that's pretty clear. And it could also be the devil. But it's also left open, is this Christ? And the path that you would have to take as presented by the book, or not really that you have to take, but it is offered to you by Endo, is this, that Rodriguez goes into this whole missionary situation seeing himself as Christ and Kichijiro as his own Judas. And in a way that, that does hold, uh, especially more so with Kichijiro. But... The alternative presented to you is that Rodriguez is Judas. Rodriguez is Judas, and Christ tells him to trample in the same sense that Christ told Judas, what you do, do quickly, and then Judas runs to betray him. And so, looked at in this way, it's not 
any kind of endorsement of apostasy. Instead, what Endo seems to be bringing forth here or offering is you, you get to the end of the book, the closing chapters, and after Rodriguez has apostatized, he's propped up just like Ferreira as this sort of professional paid philosopher, and he's writing works against uh, Christianity, and, and uh, he's obviously not allowed to practice the faith or to propagate it in any way, and he's held up as a public symbol of mockery. And they've broken him. He's a broken man. And Kishijiro comes and finds him toward the end of the book and begs him to hear his confession. And he does. He hears Kichijiro's confession. And he says this, and I find this pretty interesting. <clears throat> I'll just read the, the last uh, paragraph uh, of this chapter. Kichijiro wept softly, then he left the house. The priest had administered that sacrament that only the priest can administer. No doubt his fellow priests would condemn his act as sacrilege, but even if he was betraying them, he was not betraying his lord. He loved him now in a different way from before. Everything that had taken place until now had been necessary to bring him to this love. Even now I am the last priest in this land, but our Lord was not silent. Even if he had been silent, my life until this day would have spoken of him. And right before that, you know, he, he says, Lord, I resented your silence. And, and he hears the voice of God, I was not silent, I suffered beside you. But you told Judas to go away, what thou dost, do quickly. What happened to Judas? I did not say that. Just as I told you to step on the plaque, so I told Judas to do what he was going to do. For Judas was in anguish, as you are now. So, he's, he's trying to draw a pretty obvious comparison between Rodriguez and Judas, right? As through the voice of Christ. And so there's a couple of uh, scriptural passages that I thought might be interesting in that vein. Uh, just... If you look in, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 26, and Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and he does it for 30 pieces of silver, everybody knows that part, um, and he dips his hand in the dish with Christ and says, you know, is it I, Master? You have said so. Right? So it's pretty clear that this is Judas's choice. And Christ says... The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And that's when Judas asks, is it I, Master? You have said so. Well, what's interesting about this is, anytime I've read that passage before, I've always thought, well, of course, right, because of, of his punishment. Uh, his punishment will be so great that woe to him, it would have been better had he never been born. But what got me thinking after reading this book was, well, is it just that? Because that is definitely one way to look at it. But perhaps another way to look at it, seeing as, as nobody knows who's in hell and who's not. And now we know that, that Judas uh, killed himself, and so it does not look good for Judas, right? He's, there's mortal sins all over the place. Judas is not in a good place. And uh, he's, he's despaired. He's given up hope, not just in himself, but in God. Uh, and in God's forgiveness. And this is why uh, sort of the narrative is given in the, the scriptures that he, he kills himself. Well, isn't it interesting to think of it in terms of Rodriguez that the suffering that Judas uh, has coming for him is not simply the, the anguish of hell, but the anguish of betraying the most beautiful person, the most wonderful, the most loved person, uh, filled person you've ever met. And this is what Rodriguez is, is thinking and realizing as he's stepping on the fumier is, I am betraying the only thing worth never giving up on. The only thing worth myself and every person here and, and the stars and the sky and I'm giving up on him. I am rejecting him. Right? He says it's no mere formality when I step on the fumier. And he's sort of in this vein of Judas. Is the, the worst punishment of Judas not that he has so deeply given up on Christ? And so you often have the comparison between Judas and Peter given. I've been, uh, I've heard before that, you know, Judas and Peter are the same man with one difference. That Peter, after he despaired, he hoped and Judas didn't hope. You look at the, the crime of, of 
Peter and Judas, the sin. And it's essentially the same. It's this denial, this apostasy, this, this no, 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 I, I don't know him. I don't know him, Peter says at, around the fire. I don't know him. But then, then you have the scene where Jesus says to him, you know, Simon, do you love me? And so Peter is brought back. And from what we know of Christ, Judas could have been brought back also. Had Judas hoped after he despaired, he could have been brought back also. Judas would not have been an outcast among the apostles for what he did. He would have been forgiven, just as forgiven as the rest of them. He could have been as great a saint as the rest of them. And that's his pain, really. That's his anguish, is that he has given up everything worth holding on to. Uh, let me just see if there's anything else that I wanted to go on about here. Um, no, well, that's Mark says essentially the same thing. You know, woe to him. It would have been better had he never been born. And I think I had Luke marked. Let's see. Uh, da da da. Susan Last Supper. No, no, no. Well, I'm sure there was something, but oh well. Anyway, so that's basically been my thought process through this uh, book, trying to see it in that vein. Uh, I don't think that that takes away all the problems of the book. I don't think it takes away the problems presented by the book, but I don't think it's meant to. I don't think Endo was trying to write some uh, doctrinally perfect narrative here. I don't think that's in any ways an intent. Um, so, in that vein, uh, I see the book as, as beautiful. I think it's, again, uh, really painful and revolting in, in the sense that it's just, it's so difficult to, to deal with. Um, but in no way do I see it as glorifying apostasy. Uh, it does not present apostasy as something good, uh, or something, uh, excusable, even though it's, it's painted, look, it's understandable, um, which I think anybody in their right mind would agree it's understandable why someone would apostatize uh, uh, under torture. But it's not morally excusable, right? Uh, just like any evil act is not morally excusable, but we can understand why we do them under certain types of duress, and that's why God's mercy is such a good thing, because he understands better than the rest of us why we've done the thing that we, that we do. So, this book, I see it as trying to present a, a narrative of Judas and the psychology of Judas and uh, trying to present him as more than just a one-dimensional betraying character, that he's a, a character with uh, motivations uh, for the reason, you know, reasons why he, he betrays Christ and uh, it's under great um, distress. Obviously, it's not, it's not word for word what Judas is, but it's trying to get you, I think, to understand, look, even Judas is not some, uh, some char cartoon character. Even Judas is loved by Christ. Even Judas uh, is a person who can be redeemed. Uh, and his failure doesn't nullify that. His immense failure doesn't nullify that. So, those are sort of my first thoughts on finishing the book. Sorry it was so long. I tried to go as short as I could. But there's just, I, I, there's so much I didn't even cover. It's, it's, tough. It's tough. Um, but it really, I definitely recommend the book. Well worth a read. I will definitely read it again because I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that I missed. Um, and uh, I'll have to pick up some of Endo's other stuff because it just really appreciated it. And I do think that it's been, like I said, largely misunderstood. That doesn't mean that it's a perfect book, uh, but I don't think in any way, from what I read, this first go-round, that Endo was trying to glorify apostasy. Uh, I think he was trying to get us to understand what could cause someone to apostatize and still love Christ um, without presenting that as a good thing uh, or, a, or a laudable thing. Obviously not a goal that you want to go for, giving up on the faith, right? That's, I, I don't think that you could accuse the book of presenting that, even if you want to argue that the way it goes about presenting this, this Judas narrative is, is not perfect, uh, that's that's fine, but I, I don't think that it's trying to glorify apostasy. So that's uh, that's that. That's my view of silence.